Hey everyone, I have got like just sort of a mini little kitchen project going here. Um, I'm just sort of getting some soybeans, one and a half cups into each one of these quart sized jars so that when I want to make my soy milk and my tofu, all I have to do is get one of these jars off the shelf and then just fill it with water for the soaking overnight. I keep wanting to make soy, soy milk and tofu. I know there's a way to do it with a hot soak, but I have found that making tofu specifically, like if I want soy milk for tofu, the way to do it is to do a long soak on the soybeans. Um, doing a quick soak does not seem to yield even close to as much tofu. Like you can tell the difference in the milk, um, how thick and rich it is compared uh, like the hot soak method versus um, the long soak method. So I prefer the long soak method, but my problem is that I need to soak overnight and oftentimes in the evening, I just get busy, I get tired. I don't feel like dragging my bucket out to put dry soybeans into something for soaking. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and have little jars of the dry soybeans ready to grab and then just put the water in, have it be an overnight soak. All I have to do is just add water. Um, and then hopefully that will help me as I'm moving forward with doing more of my own soy milk and tofu. I've really been enjoying the experience but yeah <laughs> kind of trying to solve my personal little hiccups but guys generally speaking hi everyone <laughs> this is kathy the vegan prepper and welcome to i don't know if it's going to be a day in the life video or not like we'll see just welcome to my latest random video let's go for it. let's get into it do 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 vegan prepper do 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 vegan prepper I like to fill the jar inside the bucket so that if there's a little spillage, it just kind of doesn't really matter. And then normally I'm holding the jar, but I'm also holding the camera right now, so I can't really do that. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and finish filling these guys up and get them on the shelf. I think one of them I will leave on my kitchen counter because I'm planning on doing soy milk and tofu tomorrow. Right here is one of the jars for reference. I was doing one and a half cups of soybeans. Like I said, I'm gonna dump these into a bowl and put water on them. And going forward, I will just use pint-sized jars. Um, but this is the amount of tofu that I got from that amount of soybeans. Um, it is a rather large block. Now it was pressed, very, very much pressed. Um, so I, I can't really tell you what the equivalent is to like a store-bought block of tofu. This is a four cup container. It's not quite full. The block itself is a little taller than my knuckle here. Um, it's a really large block. I think it's larger than a standard one pound block. It also, like I said, it's been pressed a lot. So it's, it's probably like an extra firm tofu at this point. So I feel like it's probably the equivalent of one and a half to two blocks of regular tofu that you would find in the store just because it's so compressed and it's, it is quite a lot larger. Um, but yeah, I'm very happy with that. Um, I do really love making my own tofu. The homemade tofu tastes amazing. Um, but yeah, there you go. That's what it looks like. This is what I made the next day after I filmed the segments that you were just watching. And now I'm editing, so <laughs> I'm showing you kind of what happened after. All right, so I'm just going to leave that guy over there. And these guys are going to go on my shelf. Um, I've also got uh, some chickpeas in my Instant Pot. I'm planning on making a big curry for lunch for me and Sage. Um, she's home today. She's homesick from school. Second day in a row. Um, and thankfully today she seems a lot better, but I'm holding her back just one more day to make sure that she's totally set before she goes back uh, to fill her with a lot of really um, fortifying, nourishing foods before she goes back to school. And so, yeah, that's kind of usually the way that I do things. And so she was jumping around in puddles the other day. Um, we got a pretty decent amount of rain in the morning a couple of days ago. Um, and then at school, she was just jumping around in the mud and being crazy. She came home in her little change of clothes and then she kind of developed a little fever um, and a little bit of a cough. And then yesterday she had, it was always very low fever. It's like a 99 point. It never got higher than 99.4, um, but just a little bit of a cough, a little bit of a sore throat. And so 
I kept her back and then today she seems a lot better like I said but she didn't eat hardly anything yesterday and I want to um, make sure she gets a lot of good stuff in her today before she goes back to school so again like I said that's how I usually do things um, so anyway I'm gonna go ahead and get the bucket back on the shelf get the jars back on the shelf and yeah I think I'm gonna start another project I think I'm starting another thing so I'll bring you back in a second so my latest experiment that I'm working on is making seitan from my own fresh ground flour. So I have my wheat berries here. I'm going to go ahead and grind up two cups of wheat berries and turn that into seitan. And so I will go ahead and show you a little bit of like what my process actually looks like. I'm still kind of figuring out some of the kinks, but anyway, and I'll talk a little bit too about uh, what made me decide to even try this out? Uh, it was kind of cool. So um, yeah, let me go ahead and get to grinding. And then while I'm sifting, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that kind of stuff. and sift this flour just sifting out the biggest chunks um, I found it that with making the seitan when you go to the rinsing stage and I'll show you guys what I mean by the rinsing stage um, you end up with like tons of just huge pieces coming out it feels almost like cornmeal um, coming out of the seitan and the final result um, it's okay, but it feels like it takes forever to rinse all of those larger particles out. So I'm going to go ahead and just start off with um, sifting the large particles out. And then that way I don't have to do that. Um, or I don't have to deal with it so much in the rinsing process. Um, but the cool thing about this, the reason that I started or decided to start experimenting with making my own seitan from my home ground flour is that I have been doing a lot of baking or not baking, but, um, I've been doing a lot of bread from my home ground flour, tons of experiments that way. And so basically every single time I do, um, make the dough in my bread machine. And then, um, at the end of, of the dough cycle, obviously I take as much dough out as I can, but not all of it comes out. Um, so there's going to be like a little bit left every single time. And mostly I try to wash it right away, but there was one time I wasn't able to wash it right away. Um, and so the dough that was left over sat soaking in the bread machine pan, um, for like overnight, I think it was. And that's not the first time I've ever done that. Um, typically what happens is the whole thing disappears, um, and it just sort of goes into the water and nothing is left behind. But one of the times when I was making my bread using my home ground flour, um, what was left behind was sticky, um, long strings. And I recognized it was the gluten. And I've never seen that before, like with the all-purpose flour, it never left behind um, gluten strands after it had been soaking in water for a long time. And so seitan is something that I haven't ever, well, I have now, but at the point, at that point, I had never tried to make it myself. Um, it always felt like pointless, like why would I do it? Um, but then seeing that in the bread pan, those strings kind of went, I went like, ooh, like I could theoretically make seitan with my home ground flour. And then that's yet another use for the wheat berries, right? Um, and so, yeah, I started experimenting with making my seitan. And like I said, I'm, I'm still refining the process, but um, kind of once I get that down, uh, I hope to make a video on that. Um, and it's just like yet another awesome bit of versatility to your food storage. Um, so basically I'm going to go ahead and finish sifting this out and then I'll talk a little bit about the process that I do. Um, so far, like I, I still don't really quite know what I'm doing. Um, I'm still figuring it out, but we can, we can talk about it at least a little bit. Hopefully you don't mind these videos where 
I'm showing you stuff that I'm not 100% clear on, but like sort of showing you my experiments. Hopefully that's not super boring, but yeah, eventually I will have an official video on my method once I really know how to do it. <laughs> this is everything that got sifted out of all that flour. So see, it's, it's really not very much. It's like maybe a couple of tablespoons of bran and larger pieces. And so I'm left with still a very whole wheat looking flour. Um, and so, yeah, I was, like I said, I was so impressed by the strands of gluten that were left from the home ground flour. And I don't know if it's because it's so fresh or what, but it seems like it's producing much stronger gluten than the store-bought flours. Cause as evidenced by the fact that I've never seen those strands show up before at the base of my bread pan, right? So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get some water in here. That's it. You just use water, nothing else to basically make a dough. Um, and then that's going to sit for a while. So I'll bring you back once I or in maybe in the process or once the dough is formed. Okay, so I've put in some water. I should have taken this ring off and I didn't. <laughs> it's a little late now. Um, but basically, you just want enough water to form a dough. Um, at least for this first step. Um, and so I don't know if I got it right or not, but I just sort of put a little bit of water in here for my Berkey. <laughs> so... Um, it seems like I'm going to make a basically good dough. Sorry for the crappy camera angles. Um, I really need a new tripod. My tripod does not capture, um, good angles, which is why I never use it. I can't, um, really set it up and make it film exactly what I want it to film. Um, and so I need something better that is, um, more suited to kind of fine work. So that's why I'm always kind of awkwardly holding my phone while I'm doing things is because I'm trying to get a better view than I can get with my tripod. But basically I'm gonna go ahead and finish getting this all um, in its dough ball um, and then talk about that in a second. All right, here's my little dough ball. And so it maybe was a touch too much water, but it's not, doesn't really matter. It still formed a nice dough ball. And so now I'm going to let this sit for 45 minutes to an hour to let the gluten develop before I get into the rinsing stage. And so <clears throat> many um, seitan instructionals will tell you to sit and knead this for, you know, five or 10 minutes in order to form gluten. But, um, sauce stash over the sauce stash youtube channel um he made a video about his seitan and like do you need to knead and so it was a really excellent video so i will link that video down below and so i have decided not to do the kneading step uh because it doesn't appear to be necessary so i'm just gonna let it sit for a while and it's perfect because my beans are almost done so i need to go ahead and get started on our lunch curry um and yeah i'm gonna go ahead and get started on that go ahead cover this and get started on our lunch. All right, on to the curry. So like I said, I'm making a really nourishing and um, wonderful curry full of a lot of incredible healing compounds and stuff for Sage specifically um, as she's kind of still recovering. Although like I said, she's mostly better, but this is what it looks like. Everybody talks about chicken noodle soup. And I say, no, no chicken noodle soup. Indian food, that's what you need when you're sick. <laughs> that's what you need for recovery. You need all of these plants and all of these spices. You don't need chicken. But anyway, um, I'm also going to throw in some coconut milk uh, just because I want there to be some of that rich fat in there um, specifically for her um, to activate a lot of these vitamins and a lot of these compounds that you don't get if you don't have fat. But I'm not putting oil the coconut milk is the only fat. So I like to dry toast spices at first. Um, and so that's how I do mine. It's traditionally you, you cook them in oil instead. Uh, but I do dry toast my spices and everything still turns out tasting pretty darn good. Obviously, probably not as good as authentic, actual authentic Indian food. Um, but it makes a good approximation and I really appreciate it. This little thing right here is called a masala daba. I have talked about it on the channel before, but it's basically an Indian spice box. And so it makes it very handy, especially for cooking any kind of Indian food because you are using a lot of spices. Um, and so you just have a little spoon and you can just sort of scoop and go. And then it just becomes very easy to cook that way without having to open like a million different jars um, for all of the spices. Another thing that I really love to do, um, not only for recovering from sickness, but just in general for health 
and uh, maintenance of health, but also incredible flavor is I like to take fresh ingredients um, and make what I call flavor bombs. And so for instance, this is a mixture of shallot, ginger, turmeric, garlic, and shiitake mushroom. The shiitake mushroom I throw in because it's an incredible flavor, but because it's also an incredible help for immune system stuff and all that. So these are not only flavor bombs, these are like health bombs. Um, and so I basically take all of those things fresh, um, I wash them well, and then I throw them into a food processor and I grind them up small. And then I put that mixture into an ice cube tray and pop them out once they're frozen, stick them in a bag. Um, I had two big bags from the last batch I made. This is the last bag I'm working through this one. And I'll use two or three of these in the base of my pan when I'm making things like my curries and things like that. Um, and it's just an absolutely fantastic way to get all of these wonderful flavors without having to always stand and chop everything. But also it helps me to make sure that these ingredients don't go to waste. Cause I always end up finding some sort of, I always end up finding like a little piece of ginger or turmeric in the back of my produce drawer that went moldy because I didn't get to it in time. <laughs> and so this is how I avoid that. So basically I'm gonna go ahead and throw together a curry, no recipe just a lot of really wonderful flavors. And this is it's gonna be like two or three of these, um, cumin, coriander, mustard seed. I know that these are not the correct mustard seeds. Um, I do finally have some black ones, but I'm getting through my yellow ones before I start on those. Um, and then turmeric for sure, a little bit more powdered turmeric, garam masala. This is actually um, homemade garam masala. I, I finally started making my own Indian spice mixes. And I love it, it's wonderful. Um, and yeah, just sort of get through that. I'm not probably not gonna throw any coriander, or not coriander, um, cardamom in there this time. Uh, but yeah, these are this is my spice box. This is what I use most in my cooking. Plus these, plus probably some more fresh garlic. So I'm gonna go ahead and get into that and stop talking about all of that. <laughs> All right, I've got tomato paste and coconut milk in here now. I'm adding a pound of frozen riced cauliflower just as a veggie that disappears. <laughs> and so it's not something that's gonna be noticeable at all in the final um, dish. And so, um, yeah, I'm getting that in there just for some extra nutrition. I'm also going to go ahead and cut up a few potatoes and get those in here. And yeah, I'm just, generally very excited about this meal. It's going to be amazing. Right here is basically where I'm going to let it sit and cook now. Um, so I just cut some potatoes up and I did, I scrubbed them really well and I did little half moon shapes so that they're thinner and they cook faster. Um, and then these are organic potatoes. So I'm absolutely leaving those skins on for all of the extra minerals. You know, white potatoes get a bad rap for not having any nutrition and it's just not true at all but so much of the nutrition is actually kind of in the peel like with many other things and so we're going to make sure to absolutely save all of those minerals and all that goodness and eat it um so i'm going to let this boil gently for i don't know probably 15 ish minutes i'll start checking the potatoes at that point um and then i will start adding the chickpeas in between the uh potatoes and the chickpeas themselves, this should get a little bit of starch in it and it'll start thickening up really nicely and it's gonna make an amazing curry. Um, towards the end, I will also be throwing in a bunch of chopped greens to just increase that nutrition factor even more. 
right, I got some leftover sticky rice from last night. Um, unfortunately, it's not basmati, but this is what I have. So this is what I'm going to use. <laughs> We're going to cook that up with lunch. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get that into this stainless plate, which fits pretty perfectly into my steamer. Relatively recently, I made a video all about how I reheat food with a steamer because I don't really have a microwave. Uh, this method of heating uh, it produces an, an incredible result for anything that benefits from extra moisture while it's heating up. Things like rice, pasta, stuff like that uh, reheats beautifully in the steamer. And so I'm going to go ahead and take care of that. Uh, get that on heat because the curry is very nearly done. And so yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and keep going with the lunch process. I also personally like to fill the plate separate from the bamboo steamer because um, that way I can avoid, hopefully, any kind of spills. Um, and so I feel like if I do this correctly and nothing touches the bamboo steamer, I don't really need to wash the steamer after I do this. Um, and so that is kind of how I, I do it. <laughs> I don't know if you guys will disagree, but Basically, I get that set. I'm not gonna try to do that with only one hand, um, but then this will get heated after five or six minutes. It'll be very hot. Oh, also, I make sure to kind of loosen the rice up so none of it is in very large chunks to try to make absolutely sure that it heats up uh, very well, and then I don't have to worry about stuff not being heated up. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and get that on there. It's already boiling. And yeah, like I said, after five or six minutes, this will be heated all the way through, and hopefully, the curry will be done at basically the same time. It's all finished. If the potato I tasted is any indication, this is insanely good. I wish with all of my heart I could serve you up a portion. <laughs> but yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. The rice is done and perfect. It's I just checked the temperature. It's well over 190. And so it's ready to go. Um, and yeah, I'm going to go ahead and serve us our lunch portions, and then I think we'll come back and finish up the seitan. Okay, so we have eaten our lunch. This sat way longer <laughs> than an hour, um, but basically what I'm gonna go ahead and do is try to form this into a nice smooth ball and then cover it in water and let it sit for another half hour or so. Okay, I'm gonna try to do this as quick as I can. We have a guy here working on our internet. So I'm actually late. I should have done this like two hours ago, but anyway, basically you see the dough is in here and all I'm doing, and you can see it's beginning to come apart or the, the starches are beginning to come off in the water. So this is just washing the flour. And basically I'll do this, oopsie, until, um, the water seems overly saturated and then I'll get fresh water and after a little while what I'm going to be left with is the pure gluten which is what seitan is. So you can see that this is just it's turning into a messy ball of gluten and so I will go ahead and continue this process until the water is essentially clear um, and then I will have my gluten for the next step. All right, this is the second bowl of water. Um, and so this is what it's looking like now at this point in the rinsing process. And here's the third bowl. And so much less starch is coming out, but you can see kind of the brown stuff swirling in the water. We're still getting quite a lot of bran coming off. Um, and I know that that's because, you know, we're using whole grain flour and not all purpose. Um, but there it is. And we'll just sort of <laughs> continue. Okay, so now I'm going to let it drip for 10 or 15 minutes just to sort of let the excess water come out. It's definitely not the most appetizing looking thing, <laughs> but there you go. That is pure, well, almost pure, uh, wheat gluten. I'm sure there's still a little bit of bran and stuff left in there, but it's definitely not the most efficient use of your wheat berries, but it's a fun alternate use. And I don't know, it's kind of just fun to experiment. So I'm gonna go ahead and let that just sort of drain a bit for a little while before the next step, which is the steaming. And so there's a lot of hands-off time uh, with this, but 
The hands-on time is very minimal, like just that. The rinsing process took me less than five minutes. Um, and so it's really not that big of a deal. Um, but yeah, we're gonna go ahead and let it rest a bit and then I'm gonna get it into a steamer. All right, so I am getting a little pot ready now at this point, and so I've put a small amount of oil into a skillet um, just to keep it from sticking, although it was a little bit more than I normally would put, but there's a little bit of oil here, not a ton. I'm heating the skillet over a relatively low heat. Um, I am going to add, when it's closer, I'll add just a touch of sesame oil because I want this to be kind of Asian flavored in the, the end result and that sesame oil really helps with that. Um, and so basically this is going to heat a little bit on low heat because we don't want to cook the seitan, uh, or seitan uh, too quickly or else it'll bubble up and it won't be a very good texture. Um, and so yeah, this is going kind of low heat and now I'm going to go get the actual seitan uh, ready to put in here. All right, so here's our little <laughs> pile of gluten. Um, and there's a little bit of water in the base, so it did drain off a little. But a lot of what this is also doing is not only is it draining, it is resting. And so now the gluten has rested, and hopefully I can get this out of here without it pulling too much again. And so we want to stretch it. Look at that. It's stretching so well. This is not nearly as much as I was hoping. So next time I need to, um, I need to do a lot more. And so we're just gonna sort of bring it back on itself and twist it and then kind of do it, I don't know, like one more time. You don't really get a lot of, a lot of doing that before <laughs> it sort of gets tough again. Um, Cause it's the gluten, you're reactivating the gluten when you move it. Um, but I'm gonna basically just let, let it be like this and then peel it off a little at a time into the pot. Um, and so I needed to use a lot more of the wheat berries if I wanted a larger quantity. And so this, th this is the reason I'm kind of doing it the way that I'm doing it today. Um, a lot of times people will just steam um, the, entire, the entire loaf like in one, but I'm gonna be breaking this off into little pieces again with some of the sesame oil and a little bit of seasoning and then hopefully we can create almost like a uh asian like chicken type stir fry meat and so that's what we're going to go ahead and go do next i'm just going to sort of break off small pieces you can see it's quite tough and so i'm gonna just get these browned and cooking and hopefully we'll end up with a nice amount of some kind of stir fry meat type thing. All right, here they are for now. I'm a little embarrassed. There's a whole bunch of black coming off of my cast iron pan, but oh, they're finally starting to brown. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and get those flipped so they can brown on all sides, or I guess these two sides mainly. Then I'll show you what the next step is. Right, so these absolutely did bubble up, <laughs> even though I've been standing here for forever <laughs> trying to cook them on a low heat. They did absolutely develop some bubbles. So we're going to see, I'm going to add um, water for now. Um, that is, it's supposed to be broth. So I was going to use broth cubes. I think that that's enough. That was one cup of water, so sorry again for the awkward angle. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and add half of a broth cube in here to uh, flavor this up, cover it, and let it sit for 15 to 20 minutes, just kind of on a very low simmer. Okay, these definitely look super weird, but I'm gonna go ahead and drain off the broth and return these guys to the pan and start figuring out how to flavor them in a way that will be yummy. All right, I'm never gonna be done. I'm gonna be doing this for the rest of my life, just so that you know, like you're gonna be watching this video. I'm still gonna be in this kitchen cooking the seitan, so. <sighs> so I'm gonna do a little bit of orange juice. That's what these cubes are, there's frozen orange juice. Um, some coconut aminos. Um, just gonna try to make a nice little sauce here. I'm gonna also throw in some garlic. Um, and maybe a tiny bit of coconut sugar to sort of 
help it glaze and make a little bit of a sauce. If necessary, I can also toss in a little bit of like cornstarch or tapioca starch or something. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and like I said, I'm gonna throw garlic in now, maybe a little ginger. Um, just sort of make hopefully what ends up being something like an orange chicken glaze. It is not very much sauce in the pan, so I don't think I need a lot, but I do definitely need a little bit of a thickener. So I'm just sort of getting a little cornstarch in some water in a little bowl. And I'm gonna go pour that into the pan and that will help thicken this sauce right up. So hopefully it wasn't too much cornstarch. <laughs> Because again, I really don't need much. This isn't very much sauce at all. If I was aiming for just over a teaspoon. And we'll see if it's gonna be the right thickness. Um, and it looks like it is thickening up a bit. So hopefully that will be the exact right amount. And then I can be finished with this process. Hallelujah. It's a miracle. <laughs> It's definitely not very appealing looking, <laughs> but I would love to chop some green onions and kind of mix that in or serve it over a bed of shredded cabbage or something. And if I had any energy left at this point in my day <laughs> after everything, um, the internet repair guy, all this, these experiments, everything, taking care of sage and, and all of that, I would, you know, make more of an effort. Um, I'm a bit gutted that there's not even close to enough for a dinner, so I also still have to figure out a dinner. <laughs> but let's go ahead and taste this at least and see, you know, what, if it's good at all. The pieces look a little weird. They puffed up. I guess I cooked them a little too hot. Um, so yeah, this is not the most successful experiment, but let's see if it at least tastes reasonably good. Um, get some of this sauce. Mmm. Mmm. It's funny. The sauce is incredible. The little things themselves, it's like seitan. It's good. It's a little fake meat, you know. Um, honestly, we don't do a lot of fake meat in our house. Um, I would honestly rather just have that sauce with tofu, um, but it's still cool. I am still going to keep tweaking this process and learning um, how to do it because I think it's kind of fun to have it. Uh, the original plan was actually to take it, cut it up in the food processor and turn it into more of a ground meat um, and turn that into dinner tonight, uh, but there was just not even close to enough. And so um, I'll see if something like that could work too. Uh, but yeah, I'm always about trying to figure out new ways to do things. Um, you could, if you wanted to save yourself a ton of work and probably have more consistent results, start with uh, just vital wheat gluten rather than going through the washed flour method. Just start with the finished gluten flour, which is vital wheat gluten is usually what it's called. It makes the whole process much easier and the results are a lot more easy to control. But I'm still working on this. This is cool. It's like a like a puzzle that I need to solve. But now the puzzle I need to solve is dinner. So I'm going to go ahead and focus on that. Okay, so it turns out that the longer the seitan sits, the more delicious it becomes. And so the texture begins really improving and it's actually pretty amazing, which makes the entire process, of course, feel better. <laughs> like I was pretty, like I said, I was kind of gutted over the process. Not only because there wasn't enough, but because it's like, this is not even that good. But honestly, the longer the longer it sits, the better it gets, like I said. Um, and so it's actually kind of good. And that makes me feel a lot better about all of the work that I put into it. So it does end up being a lot of work. Um, I will definitely be doing a much larger batch next time. Probably if I did four cups of wheat berries instead of only two, it would be um, plenty for a full meal. Um, and so I will stick with that coming you know, in the future. But anyway, I am avoiding cooking dinner right now to get on here and talk to you guys. <laughs> Cause I'm still trying to, I'm still in the background of my brain. I am working dinner out while I'm talking to you. So it can look like I'm not doing anything or like I'm procrastinating. Uh, but actually I am working it out 
as we're talking. Um, so anyway, um, I wanted to share a little bit, just briefly, kind of the very short version of my absence because I was absent for quite a while. Uh, the really short version, so obviously you guys know about my trip um, because I posted about my vegan road trip food. Um, and so basically we took a rental car, we drove across the country. Um, at the end of our trip, we were over 3,500 miles total. Uh, the purpose of the trip was to move my oldest son to Washington, D.C. So now he has permanently moved to Washington, D.C. and he is currently working in the Senate. It's like really cool. Um, and so he's very excited. He's living his dream. That is absolutely what he is meant to do. He is meant to be in that scene. Um, and so he, that's where he's, that's where he belongs. That's where God has called him and that's where he needs to be. So I'm very excited that he is doing that. He's following his dreams. And yeah, so it's a little weird. My oldest son has left the nest and yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, also, we've had the start of school. Sage is starting kindergarten um, this year and Elliot is starting his senior year of high school. So it's like I've got kids at all stages of life, um, you know, college from college, from moving out to college prep to first year of school like I have a, a huge, I don't know, like a, the entire array of parenting going on right now. <laughs> it feels as I feel like Thad was graduating from high school, like when Sage was born. So that was also weird that I had one start in college and a newborn. Like anyway, it's, it's been a, it's been an interesting few years with our, our age gaps and our kids. Uh, but basically that was part of it. But also before I left on the trip, I ended up having an emergency surgery so I'd love to share the details of that. I'll probably have to do it in a different video because I don't want this to get too much longer because I know when I started talking here, the video is already over 30 minutes long. Uh, but basically I had to have my gallbladder taken out. Um, and so I, the what the doctors believe, because I've had gallstones for many years. This is not a, a new thing with me. Um, this is something that we've known about for a long time. Um, and so... The, but basically what happened was I was successfully losing weight again. Um, I hadn't talked about it a lot, but I was dropping weight. Um, and that was great, but I might've done it a little too fast because that's what they say. It's possible that I lost weight too fast, which can trigger gallbladder attacks. And it was a bit of a process. I won't get into the whole story, um, but it was about two weeks. I was dealing with random, horrible pain. Um, and then finally they ended up removing it. It was an emergency. I went to the ER and then they admitted me. And then the early the next morning they took out my gallbladder. So, um, yeah, it's interesting, interesting times. And so it was funny. I had that surgery on a Saturday and then we left for our trip on Monday. So I was on that road trip the entire time I was on that trip. I was recovering from surgery. I am still technically kind of still recovering. Um, I'm in my third week. And so this is the last point at which I can know, like I'm supposed to not lift anything heavier than 10 pounds until the end of this week. I already kind of broke it today um, because I was lifting that bucket of soybeans and that bucket of soybeans is more than 10 pounds. But um, I'm at like two weeks and five days. Okay. And I just like, I have things I need to do. I was very careful and I don't think anything happened. So um, don't tell my doctor, but <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I don't, know. I don't know. I don't, I'm not trying to be stupid. I just like, I have to live my life. Um, and so that's actually one of the great things that I think about the timing of the whole thing is that I was on the road trip. Um, and so I was kind of forced to just recover. Um, I couldn't do anything. I was not here in my home, which is my workplace and also my, my experiment grounds. Like you, you see, I'm always doing experiments. I'm always doing something. My brain is always trying to work some puzzle out, trying to do something. Um, and so I've always got to be tinkering in some way, somehow, somewhere in this house. Um, and so not being here, I think was the best chance I had to have a good recovery. And so it was actually probably a really good thing. I had a road trip right after my surgery. Um, and so I think that that really helped me. Yeah. Anyway, I can talk a little bit more about all that stuff later. Like I said, I don't want to get this too crazy long. Um, but I hope that, um, I can continue producing some more content as we move into the future. Um, and yeah, so 
I guess that's it. I'm going to leave you for now. And thank you so much for watching. I hope that that was a good video that you got some good tips or something useful out of it. And as always, I hope the rest of your day is good and your life stays wonderful. Thank you so much for watching. See you guys later. Bye. Seriously, don't tell my doctor about the bucket of beans.